Good morning, everybody. My name's John Brook. I have the great pleasure of chairing our morning session. As other speakers have before me, uh, I'd like to add my personal vote of thanks to Eric for having organized the best of all possible conferences. And on this best of all possible days, um, we have Leibniz center stage this morning. So without further ado, may I call on Donald Rutherford, uh, who teaches, of course, here at UCSD, uh, to talk on laws and powers in Leibniz. Great, thanks. Well, the stakes are now high. It's the best of all possible worlds, the best of all possible days, the best of all possible topics, and you get my paper, so we'll see how that goes. So as most of you uh, are aware, I don't think there is any 17th century philosopher who better exemplifies the theme of this conference than Leibniz, uh, God's order, man's order, and the order of nature. Indeed, I think uh, you know, 25 years or so before this conference, it was really the basis of my book on Leibniz, Leibniz and the Rational Order of Nature. So it's a topic I've been thinking about for a long time. The topic actually, as it applies to Leibniz, has several different dimensions. It involves his conception of nature, his metaphysics, his theodicy, and his ethics. And I've written on the ethical dimension of this elsewhere, and it sort of ties into some of the themes uh, of Steve's paper yesterday, which is why I said it's just Leibniz. And so if you're interested in that, you can follow up. But today I'm just talking about Leibniz's metaphysics of nature. Uh, I hope the paper doesn't run too long. Uh, I have to get through it, though, because we don't get to the punchline until the end, and I want to get to that. Um, okay, so I'll begin. Laws and powers vie for theoretical primacy in Leibniz's philosophy. The concept of law is integral to Leibniz's understanding of the order of nature and of God's providential direction of creation. At the same time, Leibniz holds that natural laws themselves must be explained in terms of natural powers intrinsic sources of activity from which instances of change follow. This is true both for prototypical physical laws, laws of motion, laws of optics, and for the law of the series that is the ground of the identity of an individual substance for Leibniz. In brief, nothing happens in Leibniz's world except through the activity of powers intrinsic to individual substances. This is a fundamental point on which he distinguishes his philosophy in different ways from those of Descartes, Melbranche, and Spinoza. The activity of powers is a relatively underexplored topic in the Leibniz literature. It is clear that Leibniz believes that powers constitute a causal ground floor and thus are to be appealed to in explaining why change occurs at all in nature. But how exactly do powers act for Leibniz? One possibility is that powers act via laws. One reason why this explanation is tempting is because for Leibniz there is no room for the activation of powers. Powers are not, as they are for Aristotle, potentials for action. They are fully complete and actual sources of activity in Leibniz's term, which he borrows from Aristotle in Telekies. Furthermore, a substantial power can be influenced by nothing outside of itself. So to the extent that particular actions and instances of change follow from it, this can only occur through a principle internal to the power, yet what could this principle be but a law that is no less intrinsic to the substance than the power itself? If this is correct, then laws presuppose powers, but powers equally presuppose laws for Leibniz. On Leibniz's account, the one cannot be present without the other, and they are equally basic from an explanatory point of view. The first two sections of my paper will summarize some central themes of Leibniz's account of the laws of nature and his thesis that laws must be grounded in powers. The third section considers the mode of activity of powers and the sense in which this activity presupposes the idea of law. I conclude with a speculative hypothesis about the character of the laws that play a fundamental explanatory role in Leibniz's account of substantial change. Surprisingly, I suggest, these turn out to include the very physical laws that give rise to his claim for a metaphysical grounding of laws in substantial powers. So first section of the laws of nature. Considerations concerning the content and significance of the laws of nature loom large in Leibniz's philosophy. As a working scientist, Leibniz is intent on determining the correct form of the laws of nature and supplying adequate theoretical foundations for them. This is especially true for the laws of optics, reflection and refraction, and the laws of motion, including the fundamental principle of the conservation of force, or vis viva. Leibniz is also preoccupied, though, with the metaphysical and theological significance of the laws of nature. 
What exactly is the ontological status of these laws? Do they represent explanatory bedrock in our understanding of nature? How are they to be understood in relation to God's providential designs and causal contribution to creation? In what follows, I'll be concerned more with these general philosophical issues and less with Leibniz's theorizing about particular natural laws, though some of the results of the latter will be presupposed in what I say. Leibniz takes for granted that nature is orderly or lawful and that it owes its order to God. In the discourse on metaphysics, he asserts that, quote, in whatever manner God might have created the world, it would always have been regular and in accordance with a certain general order, end quote, because, quote, God does nothing which is not orderly. Discourse in Metaphysics 6. There is most fundamentally a law that governs creation as a whole, and this most general of God's laws, Leibniz says, the one that rules the whole course of the universe, is without exception. The existence of a single world law comprehending all events in the created world is notable in itself and highlights God, Leibniz's conception of God as a perfect intelligence who encompasses in thought a complete rational representation of the actual world and of every possible world. Under this most general law fall both God's ordinary and extraordinary volitions, as Leibniz calls them in Discourse 6. God's ordinary volitions are coextensive with the order of nature. Natural operations, he writes, are called natural because they are in conformity with certain subordinate maxims that we call the nature of things. Events that are exceptions to these subordinate maxims are by definition miracles ascribed to extraordinary or particular divine volitions. And here in the discourse, Leibniz adopts Melbranche's distinction between particular and general volitions. In the discourse, Leibniz offers as an example of a subordinate maxim, or he says, a law of nature. So Leibniz explicitly identifies subordinate maxim and law of nature. His own principle argued for against the Cartesians that God always conserves the same force but not the same quantity of motion. Supposing Leibniz is correct in taking this to be a genuine law of nature, which is owed to God's general volition, always to preserve the same force and interaction among bodies, how are we to understand the basis in God's will for this law? There are three possibilities. The law may follow necessarily from God's nature in the way that Descartes suggests, as Dan talked about yesterday, but this for Leibniz isn't good because it undercuts the idea that the law depends upon a free divine volition. A second possibility is the law may be an arbitrary creation of God's will. And a third possibility is that the law may be the product of a volition which is directed toward a particular end. God wills a given law not and, and not another for a reason which is to achieve a certain optimal outcome. As is well known, Leibniz argues strongly in favor of the third option. Rehearsing his discovery of the true laws of motion in the Theodicy, he writes in a passage uh, Dan quoted yesterday, these considerations make it plain that the laws of nature regulating motions are neither entirely necessary nor entirely arbitrary. The middle course to be taken is that they are a choice of the most perfect wisdom. That's the first passage on your handout, and I won't read the rest of it. Leibniz identifies two essential properties of the laws of nature. First, they are not metaphysically or geometrically necessary, as he takes Spinoza to hold, but contingent. The laws of motion cannot be derived from the concept of spatial extension, other laws are equally conceivable and consistent with that concept. But second, the laws of nature also are not absolutely arbitrary. The laws themselves evidence signs of fitness or optimality. The order they dictate for the world suggests that they are what Leibniz calls a choice of the most perfect wisdom. While both of these features of the laws of nature, contingency and fitness, can be supported by arguments based on the form of the laws themselves, Leibniz's deepest rationale for thinking of the laws of nature in this way is his conception of God as a perfectly intelligent and free being who acts for the sake of the best. To think of the laws of nature as either necessary or arbitrary would be to challenge this fundamental assumption about the correct understanding of God's nature. For Leibniz, the laws of nature, quote, do not arise entirely from the principle of necessity, but rather from the principle of perfection and order, because they are an effect of the choice and the wisdom of God. The presumptive fitness of the laws of nature expressed in rules such as the equality of cause and effect and the most determined path principle that Jeff McDonough has talked a lot about in optics supplies a heuristic for scientific discovery. We are directed to search for rules with these sorts of formal, characteristic, formal characteristics because they are most likely to represent fundamental laws of nature. More important than this, however, laws that can be explicated in terms of the principle of perfection and order support a conception of the world as one that has been created by God as the best of all possible worlds. Thus, Leibniz's interpretation of the laws of nature form an integral part of his theodicy. 
Section 2, From Laws to Powers. Everything that has been said so far about the formal properties of the laws of nature is consistent with a broadly Malbranchian understanding of them. Malbranche, as much as Leibniz, believes that the laws express general volitions of God and that these volitions are directed toward a certain end or good. In the laws he wills, God is not constrained by necessity and he does not will arbitrarily. For both philosophers, God wills the laws he does because they are the best, although, of course, Melbranche and Leibniz understand this criterion differently in the two cases. Leibniz, however, stresses a further characteristic of the laws of nature which differentiates his position from that of Melbranche. For Leibniz, God's general volition, or his willing that the world unfold according to one order rather than another, is not sufficient for the determination of a law of nature. A law of nature exists only if that law is grounded in the natural powers of created beings. In Leibniz's view, this further condition is necessary in order to distinguish the natural and the miraculous. If this distinction is left to depend, as it does for Melbranche, on a difference merely in the generality of God's volitions, then we are left with no coherent notion of an independent order of nature, Leibniz believes. This leads to Leibniz's famous complaint that Melbranche's occasionalism amounts to a system of perpetual miracles. Replying to Bale, he writes, and this is the second quote on the handout, let us see whether the system of occasional causes does not in fact assume a perpetual miracle. Here it is said that it does not, because according to this system, God would only act through general laws. I agree, but in my opinion, this does not suffice to remove the miracles. Even if God should do this continuously, they would not cease being miracles, taking this word not in the popular sense of a rare and marvelous thing, but in the philosophical sense of what exceeds the powers of created things. It is not enough to say that God has made a general law, for besides this decree, there must be a natural means of executing it. That is, it is necessary that what happens can be explained through the nature that God gives to things. Leibniz's desire to establish a sharp distinction between the ordinary course of nature, which can be understood through the natures of created beings, and genuine miracles is evident. Less clear is whether he has a non-question-begging argument against Melbranche's position. There is no doubt that Melbranche has a distinction between the natural and the miraculous, which is consistent with his own theory of occasional causation. The difficulty is that Leibniz does not accept that theory of causation, and so does not accept the account of the natural miraculous distinction that Melbranche builds on it. Our priority, however, is to understand Leibniz's own account of the order of nature. Here we find, I believe, two complementary lines of argument. The first is premised on a claim about the intelligibility of the natural order. Leibniz's commitment to the principle of sufficient reason entails that, anything that, that for anything that happens, there is a sufficient reason why it happens thus and not otherwise. A further necessary condition for an effect to be part of the natural order, however, is that there be not just some sufficient reason why it happens, but that there be what Leibniz calls, quote, a natural reason, a reason that displays the effect in question as following in an intelligible manner from the nature or essence of some created being. As Leibniz comments in the preface to the new essays, and this is the third quote, but to explain myself distinctly, it must be borne in mind above all that the modifications which can occur to a single subject naturally and without miracles must arise from limitations and variations of a real genus, that is, of a constant and absolute inherent nature. For that is how philosophers distinguish the modes of an absolute being from the being itself, just as we know that size, shape, and motion are obviously limitations and variations of corporeal nature. Where, whenever we find some quality in a subject, we ought to believe that if we understood the nature of both the subject and the quality, we would conceive how the quality could arise from it. So within the order of nature, miracles apart, it is not at God's arbitrary discretion to attach this or that quality haphazardly to substances. He will never give them any which are not natural to them, that is, which cannot arise from their nature as explicable modifications. The principle, as I call it, the principle of intelligibility, of the intelligibility of nature, is a powerful tool that Leibniz wields against Melbranche's occasionalism, Newton's theory of universal gravitation, Locke's doctrine of thinking matter, and any other hypothesis which involves an ad hoc grafting of occult qualities or powers onto material things in an attempt to explain particular phenomena or effects. This style of critical argument, however, highlights the need to understand better how Leibniz himself envisions accounting for natural phenomena and the laws that govern such phenomena in terms of the natures of created beings. Pursuing this question leads us beyond the initial idea of the intelligibility of nature to consider more closely the causal grounds of physical phenomena. By virtue of what in the nature of a body or other subject of predication does such and such an effect occur? 
Again, the presum 